Tonight's lecture is a continuation of activities celebrating our 225th year, a real landmark. It's fitting that, part of that as part of that celebration, the MHS should explore the future of, his, of history. It's also fitting that our speaker tonight on the future is the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Now, I was going to go on to talk about how our, our past and our beginnings were interwoven uh, over time, but Jonathan tells me he has those remarks, so I, so I, won't, ch I won't shortchange him and I move directly to getting him up here. Before becoming president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Jonathan Fenton serves as the, served as the interim director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. Previous to that, he was president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and for 17 years, the president of the New School for Social Research. Dr. Fenton holds a PhD in American history from Yale, where he taught and was a special assistant to Kingman Brewster. He is the author of Foundations in Civil Society, volumes one and two, and two volumes on university and civil society. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Fenton. Well, thank you, Dennis. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, so let me start by offering my congratulations on behalf of the American Academy to the Massachusetts Historical Society on the occasion of its 225th anniversary, uh, and also to recognize your exceptional president, uh, Dennis Fiore. Um, we're proud of our long association with the Society. In fact, 17 of the 29 signatories to the Society's Act of Incorporation in 1794 were Academy members. Um, our celebration of such a durable institution dedicated to the history of the Commonwealth is particularly fitting opportunity, I think, to reflect on the challenges that history faces as a discipline. As Kenneth Stamp, a longtime member of the American Academy, once observed, and I quote, with the historian, it is an article of faith that knowledge of the past is a key to understanding the present. Well, this evening, I want to take up that theme, examining how trends leading up to the present might provide uh, some guidance and, I think, hope for the future. As a starting point, I should note that the Academy has a long relationship with the society, and as with any family uh, relationship, it's not always been easy. Um, when the American Academy was founded in 1780, our original charter included language stating that the Academy will promote and encourage the knowledge of antiquities and the natural history of America. Despite that stated goal, the, uh, this society's bicentennial history reports that the Reverend Jeremy Belknap cited the Academy's deficiencies in the service of history as a key reason for the founding of the society. Um, <laughs> Uh, in a letter to uh, potential supporters of the society, Belknap uh, observed, and I quote, that academy's principal focus was upon natural history and the sciences, and he expressed little hope that the American Academy would, in his words, establish a library to house historical sources. Well, it's true. Uh, while history remains a vital element of all we do at the American Academy, our interests range over uh, many areas of uh, public and intellectual life, from international security and health policy to the humanities and the sciences. And as a result, we don't focus on any one subject or topic. So I can readily concede that the historical interests of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are much better served by this society and by all of you. Um, but happily, uh, despite any uh, initial tension, uh, the Society and the Academy have collaborated often throughout the years. Between uh, 1897 and uh, 1899, the Academy shared its space at the Boston Athenaeum with the Society while the building here on Boylston Street was being constructed. And then in return, uh, your Society generously housed the Academy on the third floor here as a tenant from 89 to 1906 and again uh, for a brief period in 1911. And this reciprocity has continued. In fact, the two institutions have been collaborating on providing uh, access to historical materials since 1919, when the Academy placed some 80 volumes of historical newspapers and legislative annals on deposit here at the Society. 
And more recently, in 1991, we hosted the bicentennial meeting of the society in our Cambridge headquarters, which featured a keynote speech by Senator Kennedy, who presented the Kennedy Medal to the distinguished Harvard historian and Academy member, Oscar Hanlon. So I'm pleased to be here tonight to reaffirm our tradition of collaboration. A few months ago, uh, Dennis Fiore and Stephen Riley gave me a tour uh, of this magnificent building. And it was moving for me to sit in the office occupied by the American Academy more than a century ago and to walk through that third floor gate which once marked the entrance to the Academy's headquarters. And it was quite meaningful to view the rows of John Adams' papers and know there's much of the Academy's history here in the letters of one of our principal founders. I have to say that the visit here um, evoked a personal memory, and if you'll permit me the indulgence, uh, I'd like to share uh, briefly uh, that memory. When I was an undergraduate at Yale, I debated between going to law school uh, or seeking a PhD in history. Law had been my plan from an early age following my father's footsteps, but an encounter with an original document uh, caused me to uh, reconsider. Let me share that story. I was a student in Edmund Morgan's uh, colonial history class at Yale. Uh, as most of you know, Ed Morgan is uh, one of our country's most distinguished historians, uh, also another recipient of your Kennedy Medal. He put together a book of documents drawn from John Winthrop's diary and the records of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and I became interested in an October 1630 entry where a long list of uh, residents signed a uh, petition, you would call it, or whatever, a notice that they wished to become freemen, to have a say in the running uh, of the colony. Some historians uh, had portrayed it as a popular movement and perhaps imagined even a rally, and I wondered if there was some pattern in the order of the names, and so I came to Boston to look at the original document, which I believe was housed in the Boston Public Library. What I found were several groups of names entered by the same hand, but the groups were inscribed by different people, which suggested the names were not likely placed on the list all at the same time. And then I went on to analyze the biographies of the names in order, and I found something surprising, which was uh, the death rate uh, was higher among uh, the names uh, early on the list, leading me to surmise that the names were added over time, and some perhaps even late in that harsh winter of 1630 to 1631. Well, History 30 was a big class, and uh, I have to say I was nervous when I was told that the professor uh, wanted to see me. And I still recall my uh, visit to Ed Morgan's office in the Hall of Graduate Studies, sat me down and he said, uh, young man, I've learned something from your paper um, and I think you have uh, the potential uh, to be an historian. Well, I didn't go directly from Yale College to graduate school. I, I worked, uh, as you say, for Kim and Brewster for a number of years, but I often thought about Professor Morgan's encouragement and eventually I did decide in history. And so I can say the, uh, the journey that brings me back to Boston and the American Academy really began uh, here uh, in Boston. Um, and I have to say, uh, there was just something very uh, moving about holding that document uh, in my hand. And while I've pursued an administrative career in universities and foundations, I maintain my love of history and I'm grateful for how it's helped me make uh, judgments in the leadership positions that I've been honored to have. So I care deeply about the present health and future prospects of our discipline. Almost 10 years ago, the American Academy established the Humanities Indicators Project to provide trend data on the health of history and other humanities disciplines. Our director, Rob Townsend, is here, and I hope you'll have a chance to meet him later. At the time, leaders of the Academy recognized that the STEM disciplines were dominating public discussion, and it was thought that the extensive data gathering by the National Science Foundation uh, had played a role in that, and our academy leaders said we should level the playing field uh, for the humanities. And so since that time, and with considerable support from the Mellon Foundation and the NEH, the academy's been gathering 
and analyzing data and making it available uh, to uh, all of us, journalists, scholars, uh, policymakers, at our uh, website, uh, humanitiesindicators.org. Uh, uh, so if you go to that site, you'll see the project has been cataloging a number of troubling signs for history. None of this will be new uh, to you, I'm, I, I'm sure, but let me cite a couple. And one of the clearest measures of a drop in general public interest, the indicators report, that uh, there's a substantial decline in visits to historical sites in the U.S. Fewer than one in five Americans over the age of 18 visited an historical site in 2012, and that's a drop of uh, about a third since 1982. And another worrisome news uh, for a discipline heavily built around books, the indicators report declining interest in reading for pleasure. Uh, as of 2015, Americans spent an average of less than 20 minutes a day reading for pleasure, and that's down um, about 20% or so uh, from a, a previous decade. And in a trend that most academic historians have been looking at with alarm, the number of students earning bachelor's degrees in history fell by more than 12% in their most recent two years, and as a percentage of all undergraduate degrees, history has now fallen to its smallest share since World War II. There are other troubling signs for history as we look around the country. According to the indicators, even though revenues for history nonprofits, uh, largely uh, state local historical societies and museums, have recovered from the recession of, by 2012, 136 of these organizations failed or had to merge. Uh, and that means there are fewer organizations now working to connect the public with the past. And as most of you are acutely aware, the past decade has seen a growing gap between academic jobs and PhDs in the discipline. As of 2015, the discipline was awarding two history PhDs for every one academic job advertised, and that creates a significant challenge for the preparation and employment of the next generation of scholars. And a recent report from the indicators found that the number of history faculty positions has plateaued after rising for more than a decade. The humanities indicators were created to provide a statistical profile of the humanities as a whole. And it's important to note that the troubles that history uh, is facing are reflected across the humanities more generally. Uh, we can certainly debate whether the indicators offer a full measure of, of the health of history and imagine other metrics that might be useful. For instance, we lack data on college course enrollments in history, and that remains crucial, not just as a measure of the relative size and engagement of the discipline, but also uh, as the potential pool for future college majors. We also lack information on the health of significant public institutions that support critical research, such as public archives across the country. So at the Academy, we plan to develop data in the next few years uh, on these topics, and you may think of other uh, information that would be useful to have, and if so, please be in touch uh, directly or through Dennis. I think we can agree that there are very good reasons to feel concerned about the health uh, of history. The shared challenge for historical societies, universities, and historians presents an opportunity, though, and that is to revisit the strength of the discipline and forge new links across institutions seeking a path forward. Your meeting uh, tomorrow uh, is a very important step on that journey. I would just want to emphasize that, a very important step. So one question that uh, this conference has posed, uh, is history in crisis or in transformation? Good question. Uh, I'd shift it just slightly and ask, was there ever a golden era when history was widely embraced by the general public and leaders in all fields? If we look back uh, to the early 20th century, we'll find familiar sounding laments about the lack of government support for history work, as well as professional historians' ability to write in a way that captures a wide public audience. For instance, a century ago, uh, John Spencer Bassett, a distinguished historian at Smith College, diagnosed the problem in terms that may sound familiar. He observed, and I quote, uh, that 50 years ago, historians like Bancroft and Prescott stood side by side with the great poets of the world of letters. Today, the historian's influence has waned. He is perhaps a more genuine writer of truth and more industrious, but he's not at the top of the world as formerly. 
and even present concerns about the effect of technology on our audience have precedence. At various points in the early 20th century, historians worried that moving pictures, radio, and then television were undermining the public taste for history. In the late 1930s, the historian Charles and uh, Mary Beard went so far as to worry about the effect of movies on democracy. As they said in their words, American Democrats were entertained by kings and queens in a succession of historical pictures. Well, I think both history and our democracy have survived, and so it's uh, worth reflecting on the gap between the alarms sounded at particular moments and the durability of the discipline. Historians address those concerns by finding new ways to integrate or accommodate the emerging technologies of the day into their work. Uh, in his interesting book, Historians in Public, uh, Ian Terrell traces the efforts of early 20th century historians, historians <clears throat> to employ technologies from lantern slides to radio and movies to bring quality historical work to a wider audience. The record shows a wide variety of historical organizations and individual historians harness these new tools to reach out to wider audiences or to connect with their audiences in new ways, whether to students in the classroom, visitors to historical sites and museums. So I think we can look to history and see that recent technolog technological changes offer just another tool and should not be viewed as an exceptional or even a new threat. So despite the statistics I cited earlier, I do not believe that history is in crisis or on some irreversible downhill plunge. Historians have been troubled about the state of the discipline before, but history has proven resilient. However, we are likely in a period that requires fresh and creative ideas and stern determination by historians and the wider public who appreciate the importance of history by those of us here in this room. Organizations like the Massachusetts Historical Society and the American Academy, um, and we who gather at this conference tomorrow, have a responsibility to educate the public about the importance of history. And we also have to become more comfortable in engaging the public in the context of their own personal interests in the past, which is likely different from that of a professional historian. I'm an optimist by nature, but also a realist. I accept the warning signs demonstrated by the Academy's humanities indicators and the data I cite, but I also look for trends to build on for signs of hope. The past continues to have a substantial presence in our lives, which suggests at least latent interest uh, among the public in history. Our culture seems saturated with history, if you think about it, as we see TV channels, television series, podcasts, and films all built around historical themes and subjects. For example, the History Channel has the 14th largest viewership on television last year, and historical documentaries and programs remain among the most watched programs on PBS. And more recently, we've seen a Broadway musical, Hamilton, foster a national conversation about the first Treasury Secretary and his placement on the $10 bill, all while selling out uh, hundreds of consecutive shows and win winning a Grammy, a Pulitzer, and 11 Tonys in a single year. So the evidence suggests that at least a segment of the public remains interested in connecting to versions of the past as a form of information and entertainment. Even the recent activism on America's college campuses suggest a measure of historical mindedness among students as they focus on challenging figures and symbols from the past. Think about the Brown family's involvement uh, in the slave trade, uh, the residential uh, college at Yale named after uh, John C. Calhoun, and student protest led to a careful review of the record of Georgetown University's sale of slaves in 1838 and the decision to rename two buildings and offer admission preferences for descendants of slaves. So I suggest we can set aside questions about the wisdom of efforts to scrub the historical record from public places and atone for past sins. My point is just to note that the growing focus on symbols of the past reflects a wide historical awareness uh, that we should take advantage of. We should ask ourselves why those signs of latent interest and uh, engagement with history have failed to flow into a more robust connection of the public to history and support for historical organizations. There are clearly some sparks of interest, 
how might we fan those sparks into a more productive flame? That's our question. That's our challenge. I believe we need a sustained campaign to educate the public, especially young people and newcomers to our country, about the importance of history. Yes, this has been done before. Of course it has. But the campaign must be continuous. Use modern means of communication. Engage advocates beyond the profession and make the case in a language people can understand. Much has been written over the years about why the study of history is important. Uh, you undoubtedly have read a lot, written a lot yourselves. I'm going to cite four reasons that stand out for me. I know there are more, but here are four that matter to me. First, the knowledge of history is critical to exercising our rights and fulfilling our responsibility as citizens in a democracy. The study of history helps us understand complexity, appreciate difficult choices and trade-offs, discern patterns, temper our instincts with evidence, and strengthen our capacity for judgment informed by values as well as practical considerations. Too often as late, we have heard people talking about the worst situation ever or the need for change without any sense of the direction or shape of that change and the historical antecedents where we are on the arc of our history. At the Academy, we often turn to history to draw both evidence and examples that can help lift a conversation out of a particular political position or the rhetoric of the moment and instead focus attention on the trajectory of a current policy uh, from a disengaged uh, distance and thinking through the challenges of the present with a kind of reserve and objectivity that careful decision making requires. History also helps us understand the principles and purposes that influence the institutions that shape our society and our lives. History provides tangible examples of the benefits of civic engagement. Perhaps equally important, history also gives us a perspective that nothing is inevitable and that leadership and engaged citizens can determine a better future. And that observation has special urgency in this election season. No further comment. Um, <laughs> a second point that uh, strikes me is that the knowledge of history and culture of other countries is essential to relations with other peoples marked by compassion, respect, and a sensitive understanding of the differences in views and interests that must be bridged to ensure a peaceful and just world. Just recently, the Academy announced a study of civil wars and international security, which will rely heavily on historical examples. The discussion starts from an exploration of the collapse of order in countries around the world during the past two decades. Patterns discerned from historical examples can help guide preventative measures, measures that must be based on knowledge of the individual histories of future fragile and failing states if we are to intervene in a constructive way and prevent these destructive civil wars. My third point, history helps us understand people with different backgrounds, beliefs, and characteristics so that we can aspire to be a country that respects diversity and draws strength from it. As president of both a university and a foundation, I have developed a particular interest in questions about civil society and have often found that history provides the material that makes a vital civil society possible. We come to appreciate and respect people of different backgrounds as we learn how they arrived at an understanding of their own lives and position in society. Thus, greater historical understanding can provide a healthier basis for engaging with people of diverse backgrounds and life experiences within our own country. And finally, reading history, as we all know, can be enjoyable and satisfying for us individually, helping us understand our personal journey and where we are in the arc of our development. It gives us roots in a fast-moving world, helps us order an overwhelming amount of information, and makes sense of rapid change. And speaking personally, the study of history makes me more optimistic and determined to work for a country and a world with opportunity for all. Too often we fail to articulate the simple pleasure that reading or engaging with history can provide. History opens up new and different worlds to us and often does so in a way that invites engagement in much the same way as a good mystery. 
whether through a book, a documentary, or exhibit, history has the capacity to transport us to a place that resonates with present concerns, but also draws us in as we try to link the pieces together, either among events in the past or uh, between the past and our own lives. And as my personal experience at Edmund Morgan's course demonstrated, a moment of connection with an historical document can open up a new world and change the direction of somebody's life as it did mine. We should not be shy about making the case for history to the general public through whatever tools we have, and we should do it often and continuously. It's not uh, a campaign here and there. It's every day, all of us. In Who Owns History, Eric Foner uh, quotes James Baldwin, who makes a powerful case, writing, and I quote, history does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. Well, the Massachusetts Historical Society has taken the lead before in organizing efforts to reach out to a broader public and to make the case for the importance of history. When Charles Francis Adams, uh, your president, uh, dedicated this building in 1899, he noted that the founder's sense of history, of the history community, was breaking down, changing, as the historians of the future, and I quote, probably is not at once a literateur, a soldier, a statesman, a lawyer, a theologian, a physician and a biologist. He reflected a growing awareness that historians were becoming more professional and specialized on the one hand, and that the potential audience for history had grown considerably larger and more diverse than the society's membership had been in the past. He observed that this created a new set of challenges for the historical society. How would historians who had a focused interest in one particular subject, something they might turn into a book-length uh, monograph, connect to the larger public that the society had grown to represent and embrace. Well, that remains the challenge today, doesn't it? The Massachusetts Historical Society, I think, is a model of how historical organizations can engage and serve the public, and I congratulate you for that. The recently opened exhibition out here on turning points in history offers a powerful example of how historical organizations can use their rich collections to raise public awareness of key features of historical understanding. And the Society's active social media presence reaches a new generation by making the collections eye-catching invitations to further in-person explorations here at the Society. And I noted an amusing picture in July, as I was doing my homework, um, where the Society tweeted a, a picture showing somebody I admire, Teddy Roosevelt, riding, uh, guess what, a horse uh, over a fence post. Uh, and he had inscribed the picture to a longtime friend, Henry Cabot Lodge. Well, as those examples show, social media and new forms of communication are already valuable for historical learning trends that we can accelerate. Clearly, a crucial stage for history's vitalization is finding a way to awaken an awareness of the value of history while young Americans are still students. History remains a core part of the curriculum in the schools. 95% of high school students take a course in U.S. history. But we might well ask how well that uh, exposure benefits either students or a history field. Now, we have an old survey to cite here. We need a new one. Uh, 1997 survey found that most Americans associated the word history with a much loathed course in school, uh, <laughs> even as Americans felt a close interest and affinity for the past when it was associated with family and nation, that's important. Building the understanding that history and past and family and nation are not separate subjects, but rather different ways of talking about the same thing is one of the most important tasks for history education at the primary and secondary school level. But we have to ask whether standardized uh, testing requirements are limiting the flexibility and creativity of teachers in the classroom. Uh, I think the answer is yes, and if I'm right, then we need, to, uh, we need to speak up. While improving the quality of history in civics in schools and colleges is important, it's obviously not going to be sufficient. We're living in a new age where people want to be active participants and not passive recipients of knowledge. They learn history by interacting with it, using it in museum exhibits, 
games, and of course, in a variety of media, including video games. There's some excellent programs out there uh, that try to nurture a positive student interest in the past, and I'll, let me cite just a few. Uh, National History Day, for instance, a school-based program sponsored in Massachusetts by this society. It brings together thousands of middle and high school students at the local, state, and national level to create history in a wide variety of forms, from traditional papers to websites and exhibits. And in doing my homework, uh, I was moved by the example of three 16-year-old National History Day students in Illinois who made a documentary on the murder of three civil rights workers in Mississippi in 1964. And uh, most of us here remember that tragedy. Uh, well, that documentary led to a reopening of the case and to the conviction of the killers 40 years later. Quite amazing. And to think those students really understand the importance of history and the reward of telling the story. An independent study of National History Day in four states found that students who participated in the program were more interested in their history classes and find those classes more interesting than other academic classes. Uh, the program provides an engaging way to fire an early interest among students and also, in the words of the study, help them develop a more mature perspective uh, on current events. And earlier I mentioned how the Broadway play Hamilton had sparked a renewed interest in the founders of our country. In October 2015, the uh, Hamilton creators, together with the Rockefeller Foundation and the Gilder Lerman Institute, uh, launched an educational partnership to provide 20,000 public school students with the opportunity to see Hamilton on Broadway, coupled with a history curriculum designed around the play. And as the show uh, moves in, uh, on a road trip next year across the country, the program will expand to other cities, creating new opportunities to connect students in a lively and captivating presentation of the past that is intended to engage a multiracial audience. Um, I have to confess that um, as part of my um, due diligence for this occasion, I went to see Hamilton last Saturday. <laughs> and it's quite simply the best Broadway I've ever seen. And another confession, um, while I know Ron Chernow and have read <clears throat> much of his work, I've never read Hamilton, but I will now. I just felt myself desperately wanting to read that book uh, as I sat in the audience. Um, any case, uh, a little commercial for Hamilton, it's worth it. <clears throat> At the uh, national level, the American Historical Association recently initiated uh, an Everything Has a History campaign on social media, linking historical context to trending topics in the news. And their effort to remind people that the current events are deeply embedded in the past has been used in social media messages and crossed over even to traditional uh, uh, media such as the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune. And at a more local level, there's an example uh, of the Philadelphia History Truck out of Temple University's public history program, which uses a converted uh, old uh, food truck as a mobile museum and a staging ground for gathering local history in city neighborhoods. It works with members of the community to build a history that members can recognize as their own. And each of these programs I've just talked about represents a fresh attempt to connect uh, contemporary audiences to history. And as we think about making the case uh, about support for the study of history, we should also consider a uh, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, think about events, world events, aid programs, conflicts that cost more or yielded less because of lack of understanding of history. During the Iraq War, for instance, officers at the Pentagon belatedly turned to an out-of-print history about the French experience during the Algerian Civil War, seeking a better understanding of insurgencies in a Muslim nation. As this example demonstrates, our leaders have a tendency uh, to learn too late uh, and to consult history um, too late. In a recent article in the Atlantic, Academy member Graham Allison, along with uh, Niall Ferguson, made the case uh, most directly recommending a presidential council of historians. They argued for a new and rigorous applied history 
and attempt to illuminate current challenges and choices by analyzing precedents and historical uh, analogs. This seems like sound advice, not just for the value it could bring to national decision making, but also for the example it would set for the general public. We need a narrative about the importance of history for our democracy, for a fair and decent society, for respectful and peaceful relations among nations, and for our personal growth and security. Allison and Ferguson's uh, proposal, I think, would be a positive step in that direction. Historians also need to be more willing to participate in public discussion of controversial issues, although that's easy for me to say, much harder when you're not, uh, you're not the person on the receiving end of a Twitter or Facebook uh, insult. But we as historians should work to create the expectation that an historian will have something to say of value to contribute to a conversation about a charged contemporary issue. TV viewers should come to think that it's strange for an historian not to be part of a panel of experts on a news, profs about, a news program about a Keystone Pipeline or Black Lives Matter protest or an international trade agreement. Just ask yourself as you watch uh, the uh, evening news or the Sunday talk shows, um, how many historians uh, will you see on, on the panels? Not many. And so I think perhaps there should be greater incentives for academic historians to look to an audience that extends beyond the profession. Uh, a recent indicator survey of history departments found that only one out of four considered engagement with the public of more than marginal importance in tenure decisions, indicating that the gap between the public and uh, historians is not a one-sided problem. This is something that should change uh, in history departments in all of higher education, uh, but it needs to start earlier. Uh, and how can we train graduate students to communicate with a wide range of audiences and to feel uh, a, a sense of responsibility for bringing their knowledge, their craft, their insight uh, to the public uh, at critical times when public and policymakers have to make uh, important life and death decisions. Well, I've given only a sample of promising ideas and initiatives uh, here for engaging uh, the public in history. I'm sure there are more, and clearly there's a lot more to do. Uh, but as a consequence of the conference here tomorrow, I've been thinking about how the American Academy uh, can be of help. Um, for inspiration, I look to a current academy project called the Public Face of Science, which aims to understand how the public builds trust or develops mistrust in science and the scientific process. In today's saturated media environment, the key question is how to keep the public engaged with science and scientists. The available data suggests that a majority, uh, that a major determinant of public perception of science is what one might think of as uh, participatory encounters. Science museums, festivals, citizen science projects, television programs and movies with scientific themes and so forth. Yet we have almost no data on the long-term effects of such encounters or how the public views science and the same could be said uh, about history. Uh, the Academy is embarking on an effort to collect and analyze the available data on this question in science to identify gaps and methods to collect new data. Uh, on how these activities uh, affect uh, people's perception of science. And were a similar study to be undertaken for history, we might learn surprising things about what factors actually shape the public view of our field. The Academy has also organized a coalition of leading organizations which champion greater investment in basic science. The coalition will cultivate a group of individuals influential individuals from outside the research community to speak publicly about the value of science and engineering research. And I think their effectiveness will derive from uh, the fact that um, they speak from conviction uh, and concern for the nation and not merely out of uh, self-interest in getting more grants. Um, this group um, will provide a staple, uh, a stable of additional voices to add to existing outreach efforts organized by leading science and professional organizations. And the purpose of this venture is to promote the importance of basic research in America, the need for a sustainable federal investment over the long term, and a robust partnership across government, academia, and industry. That program seems to me to be a potential model for history as well. Let us recruit 
uh, messengers from leaders outside of our profession, such as corporate executives, television and film personalities, and nationally uh, syndicated columnists to make the case for the importance of history to the public. And let us communicate more effectively what basic research in history looks like, what resources are required, and what materials are there to be studied. But we must also not forget to convey what historical research can feel like, the emotional uh, charge that encountering a petition for greater participation in 1630 can give to an undergraduate almost 350 years later. So as the American Academy approaches its 250th anniversary, we'll be looking at our history and asking how well we have fulfilled the original vision of John Adams. In a letter to his wife Abigail in 1776, a letter which resides right here, Adams sketched a broad vision for the Academy, but one rooted here in Massachusetts. In his original sketch, he imagined a, and I quote, a philosophical society shall be established at Boston. For New England must produce the heroes, the statesmen, the philosophers, or America will make no great figure for some time. So guided by Adam's vision of an organization that embraces both the past and our responsibilities for the future, I could well imagine the American Academy would be open to working with the society on a vigorous initiative to raise awareness about the importance of history. We might begin with an exploratory meeting co-hosted by the Academy and the Society uh, to chart our course. This is not a time for hand-wringing in the discipline. Given the many clear and substantive benefits of history, I'm not discouraged by the recent data and remain optimistic about the future. We are gathered here today because we recognize the great value of history for the Commonwealth, for the nation, and for the world values that the Massachusetts Historical Society has embodied now for 225 years. This is an appropriate occasion to ask with uh, renewed urgency, how can we as historians uh, strengthen our connection to the public and renew the discipline's vital role? Your meeting tomorrow asks the right questions and no doubt will yield insights that will evoke a rich follow-up discussion and a call for action. Our two institutions share a storied history. We've lived together, uh, have many members in common, are animated by the spirit and presence of John Adams, and believe in the importance of history to democracy and research to policy. Our disposition is optimistic, and our commitment to strengthen the study and use of history deep and enduring. So let us think of this occasion as the beginning of a new chapter in making common cause. I thank you.